Deborah, thank you. That was beautiful. Welcome this morning. I gather that everyone remembered to turn back their clocks. <laughs> Not everyone. I see some people shaking their heads. Hopefully you remember to do that. If you didn't, you would have been here much, much earlier, which might not be a bad thing. Yes, daylight savings time to me is not one of my favorite holidays. It's probably my least favorite, especially in the spring when we lose an hour. But praise God, at least we've gained an hour. It is so good to see each of you. What a blessed day it is to be able to come in freedom to worship our King and Lord and to come in this beautiful sanctuary. And I just, I wanna again begin by thanking First Church of Christ for your uh, uh, willingness to work with us because we believe God has a significant plan ahead for both Living Hope Bible Church and First Church of Christ. And I believe that both of our churches can do much more together than they can do separately. And I believe this is the work of God and I hope you're excited. I'm excited about being here today. God's going to do some amazing things. And we want to begin where we always begin, by exalting and honoring our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The worship team will now come. Good morning. Good morning. We are ecstatic to be here this morning. And uh, as we do every first month of of, or every first Sunday of the month, I'll yeah. get that right. Every first Sunday of the month, we do hymns. Um, so we have a nice combination throughout the month of hymns and praise songs. And we also do a section called favorites. So um, I will give you advance notice now that uh, we will be using the hymnals in front of you for our favorites. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, be prepared. We'll, we'll go th probably through three or four favorites mm -hmm. and, uh, and just make that a part of our worship service this morning. So please stand. We're going to start with two hymns, and we're going to intermingle the two. I found a friend, mm -hmm. and now I belong to Jesus. I found a friend, oh such a friend, he loved me ever I knew him, he drew me with the cords of love and dust. Oh, 
Okay, I wasn't sure. Thank you, guys. Let's remain standing for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can sing such a beautiful hymn as that, that we know this morning because of our faith and trust in you, in your Son, we belong to you. And we are under your loving care for all eternity. Father, we are so blessed today, and we come. We come to your house today to express to you how indebted and how thankful we are for your amazing salvation, your amazing love, your amazing care over each of us. We are blessed to be your children, Lord, and we just thank you that we can fellowship with you today. We ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would guide us into your truth, that we would enter into green pastures and feed from our loving shepherd's hand. Father, bless us today. Bless each person here and bless our service that it might abound to the honor and glory of your name. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I want to welcome each of you, and uh, we praise God that hopefully we did not have any parking issues this morning. Can I ask again, anyone have any issues, or if you did, uh, please come to me after the service. I have found by exploring the neighborhood that there is plenty of parking all around us. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to search for it a little bit, but it's there. Uh, and we just want to make sure that each of you do not have a problem in coming to worship. Uh, so if there is any issue, please, please let us know. Again, as you folks realize, there is much to do as we, by God's direction and grace, merge two churches together. And it will not be an easy task, but I believe it will be a blessed one as we work together. And there's much that we need to do. Um, one of the things that I mentioned to some of the ladies this morning is we like to put up uh, Christmas decorations for the beginning of Advent. And uh, that is the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. So if there is anyone in the church that oversees that, is in charge of that, if you wouldn't mind after the service coming to me, uh, we have uh, some folks that usually we have a large 
artificial Christmas tree that we, end, we do put up in our sanctuary. Uh, we'd rather not lug it all the way over here if we didn't have to, uh, but we can. But I, we just want to see what you normally do. And um, so if one of you or some of you can let me know about that, because we want to make the Advent season Christ-centered, Christ-honoring. And uh, so that is one of the many things that we have in transition. Another thing is that Living Hope Bible Church uh, normally has a yearly Christmas banquet. And in years past, we've done it at um, Jonathan's, which is, I would tell you, if you haven't been to Jonathan's, you need to go there. It's a wonderful restaurant. <clears throat> it's located on Main Street in Wilkesbury, right when uh, you turn off of River onto Main. It's about the equivalence of a block down. And uh, a River Street. What did I say? Main Street. Main Street. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we are in the process now with both congregations. The challenge is, do we have enough room to have a banquet at Jonathan's? And that we're trying to look into that. It may not be possible. So we are looking for other venues. But we want everyone from First Church to know this is a special tradition that we have that we would love for each of you to be a part of. Um, and we will give you more details as we gather them. Um, we try to keep the cost relatively down, but it is a, uh, you know, usually $20, $22, somewhere in that range. We'll see what we can find. But um, we will have a sign-up sheet. Once we have the details, hopefully next Sunday, we will have a sign-up sheet for you. Um, and another thing, again, we could go on and on, we want to do a combined directory. So we want to know your names and your addresses, your phone numbers, and we want you to know ours. So that is another uh, thing that we're going to work on in time, is putting together a new combined directory. Because I use the directory many times when I pray, uh, I try to pray for each and every person in our church. And when I have a complete list in a directory, it makes it much easier for me to pray for you and also to be able to contact you uh, in, in through text or phone call. So these are just some of the things. Another thing that you probably noticed today, 1015. We thought it would be a good thing to compromise. We have met at 10. You have met at 1030. So we thought, let's split the difference and do 1015. So I hope that's not a problem uh, for our folks or for you. Um, I think our people tend to like it a little bit later. Um, so we're going to continue to do 1015. Please keep in mind there's a Sunday school that I teach that is offered downstairs beginning at 9 a.m. We have just started forging into the New Testament. We've been about three or I've lost track, maybe four years in the Old Testament. We're now going to transition into the New Testament by doing a Bible survey, looking at each and every book of the Bible. I always say that, you know, was it uh, Baskin Robbins? They had, what, 39 flavors? Well, God gives us 66 flavors, 66 books of the Bible that are each a gift from our God that we should know, understand, and apply to our lives. And that's why we're going through uh, the Bible. So join us for that. I promise you only a couple more things. You have the bulletin. You can read poinsettia sale. That is another thing that we do every Christmas. We love to fill the sanctuary with poinsettias. Uh, I apologize. We do not have those forms here today. We will try to remember to bring them next Sunday on the back table because we have a deadline date fast approaching, don't we, Sue? <laughs> so so um, maybe come prepared next Sunday to fill out a form if you're interested in poinsettias. Last one, I promise you. Another thing that we do as a church, we have a traditional Thanksgiving service. Uh, we do it, it's a little bit different, we do it on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It's in the evening. It's Tuesday, November 23rd, 7 p.m. We will be having it here, and we would invite you to join us. We know that Thanksgiving can be hectic, and Wednesday, you're preparing turkey, traveling, whatever. 
That's why we do it Tuesday. We want you to be a part of that. So please mark your calendars for all of these special events. Um, with that in mind, we're going to continue. Um, I want to share just very quickly before we have a video that is going to be presented. I don't know how many of you know this, but today millions of Christians throughout the world are uniting to pray for the persecuted Christians. This year's in the, uh, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church provides each of us with an opportunity to remember and pray for, listen now, the 260 million believers around the world who are experiencing high to extreme forms of persecution. And you heard the number right, 260 million Christians today throughout the world are being persecuted in some way. And we need to be aware of that. In Hebrews 13, 3, we are told, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body, meaning the body of Christ, the family of God. Throughout the world today, many believers are being ill-treated, imprisoned, displaced, and even martyred for their faith. We want to pr present a brief video presentation now that can help us better understand what is going on globally and how we can better pray for our suffering brothers and sisters in Christ. In 1940, Nazi forces invaded Richard and Sabina Wormbrand's home country, Romania. There were no safe spaces for Jews. And though Christian, Richard and Sabina were ethnic Jews. Be afraid, for I am with you. Genesis 26. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua 8. I am. I'm kind of afraid. They are asking to see IDs. All our lives remaining. Now we're Jews only. Christian, really? Show me about the Christian party again, right? Dă-te la o parte, știu că ascunze vrei aici. Puteți să vă uitați, dar nu e niciun evreu aici. Perhaps you should get out if you still can. Run away? If we stay, I'll follow the others into prison. It will be the end of our life together. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We believe this, or we don't. Richard and Sabina, like many Christians during World War II, had a choice. Lay low and 
hope the worst passed them by, or get involved and be the hands and feet of Christ, all at great personal risk. I think we have to stay. We have a job to do. If they are coming, then they are coming. Let's not think of them as enemies to be feared, but rather as a mission. Like Sabina and Richard Wormbrand, today's persecuted Christians, living in hostile areas and restricted nations are bold witnesses for Christ. Choosing to give up their comfort and safety in this world in order to find a life that counts for eternity. The first request from our persecuted Christian brothers and sisters is, will you pray for me? As we pray for them to endure opposition in order to advance the gospel, may we be inspired by their example to pay any price necessary in obedience to Christ. Powerful stuff. Hard not to get a little emotional. There are many brothers and sisters of ours in Christ, even now as I speak to you, that are being beaten. That are being taken from their family members, their homes, and that are standing for Jesus Christ. You know, I often am convicted as an American Christian. We so often complain over the littlest, smallest things when there are so many brothers and sisters in Christ that are giving up so much. Their children, their spouses, their lives. You know, I, I believe today should awaken us in some ways to not just pray, but to also look at our own lives and reflect on how committed we are to Jesus Christ. If someone walked into this church today, God forbid, with a gun and said, listen, who here worships Jesus Christ? It would be my prayer that each of us would boldly stand and say, I do, without any regret or any remorse. We serve a great God. He is worthy of our allegiance and faithfulness. Christ went willingly down the path of the Via Della Rosa, the path of suffering. He willingly gave his life. He calls us to be willing to lose our lives that we might find them in him. And as was mentioned in the presentation, that all of the people that suffer, the one thing they ask from us more than anything else, is for prayer. They don't ask for de deliverance. They don't ask to be taken from their captives. They ask that we would pray that they would stand faithfully. Today, let's remember them. Let's remember to pray for them. And let's also pray for ourselves that we might be worthy witnesses of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to just lead us in a quick word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful presentation. Thank you for reminding us and even convicting us this morning that, Lord, our lives here in America are really not that bad, relatively speaking. Yes, we see things changing in our country, and we know that persecution will increase here. But, Father, we still have many of our freedoms that many Christians worldwide do not have. Father, help us. Help us to remember our brothers and sisters. I think of my sister Annette and how burdened she is for the persecuted church. And I, I wish she could have shared something today, but I know 
I know she's been caring for her husband. And Father, I thank you for Annette. And I thank you for all of those in our church that spend time to pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord. We lift them up to you today. Give them safety, if it be your will. But more than anything, give them boldness, Lord. Boldness to stand for you that they might show forth the unconditional love and grace of Jesus Christ, that their captives or their captors and their persecutors might be convicted and might be one to Jesus Christ. Father, help us as well. Help us to realize that to mention your name is a very small thing, relatively speaking. Help us not to be ashamed of you but to boldly declare you and your name to those around us, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family. Father, may they know without a shadow of a doubt that we are followers of Jesus Christ and there is no shame but only privilege to represent you. Father, thank you for this Sunday and for all those who are praying. Thank you again. We ask and give you all the glory and ask all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Just so those know, we support several missions. We as a church give more than 10% of our budget to missions. When I started Living Hope Bible Church 15 years ago, it was my goal and prayer that we would eventually get to a point as a church where our missions would exceed 10%, and we do. And some of the missions we support are Voice of the Martyrs, which it was founded by the two individuals that the video presented. There's a movie, in fact, they're going to be showing, I believe, Annette in, a, in the next week or so in theaters, Sabrina, I believe it's called. Um, and we'd encourage you to watch that. And maybe we can even show that at our church at some point when it's made available. But we support Voice of the Martyrs. We support Samaritan's Purse, which is another global ministry that helps people that suffer from catastrophes and hardships. So we are involved in a number of global missions uh, throughout the world, and I hope to share that more with those at first about some of the missions that we do support and hope to increase our support in the years ahead. We are going to move on, though. We do need to move on and to our scripture reading, and I don't know who our scripture reader is today. Is it Curtis. Curtis, my fellow youth pastor. This is our uh, part-time youth pastor, Curtis. You can see he's a lot taller than, than <laughs> me. <laughs> he loves the Lord Jesus like I do, and he also loves our Philadelphia Eagles, too. I had to get, I had to get that in there. I'm sorry. Please stand. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 30 through 34. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Mm. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Thank you. Amen. Amen, Curtis. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you again, Curtis. Praise God. Uh, this is the section in our service every month when we do our more detailed communion celebration. We are going to allow you to come and pick favorite hymns. These are hymns that I grew up on as a believer, and I'm sure many of you did. So if you have one, don't hesitate to raise that hand and shout out. Oh, I already see a couple hands. I'm going to let you guys decide. <laughs> yes. 430. We'll get it in. Okay. Number 321. It is well with my soul. And we'll do verses 1 and four. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when song Thou hast taught me to 
had a request. 4.30, Joel? Yeah. I wanted to make sure Joel got his in there. Have we skipped Joel in the past? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know I love him. I don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Mm. Count your blessings. Mm. Mm. So, so before we start, there's, a, there's a, a little background to this hymn. Um, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's in two weeks, I think. We are going to celebrate together Sue Harper's 100th birthday. Yes. Um, she, she's not here today, but she will be here. Uh, she's a faithful, faithful member of what now will be our joint congregation. And this is by far her most favorite hymn. So count your blessings, think of Sue Harper, and think about becoming 100 years old. Amen? Verses 1 and 4 again. Count your blessings. Seven, eight. 
be thou my vision. How about one, three, and five? One, three, and five. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save thou, thou art. Thou my best heart, by day or by night. For he knows me, thy prayer. Amen. Praise God. Some beautiful hymns there. We don't often get to sing, and it's good to sing them. My, one of my all-time favorites is Be Thou My Vision, a uh, beautiful Irish hymn with some powerful words. Uh, but we are going to take up our tithes and offerings now, so I'm going to ask if our ushers uh, will come forward. Who do we have today? 
Um, thank you, Kurt, Curtis and Linda. Appreciate that. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. There is none like you. And we ascribe the glory and honor that is due you today, for truly you are holy, holy, holy. And we bow our hearts and souls before you today, acknowledging that you are almighty and all perfect in all your ways. Father, we give now with a cheerful heart, recognizing that you are the giver of every good gift. And all that we are and all that we have is from your hand. So, Lord, we freely give back, acknowledging that you are Lord of all. Bless those who give, bless those who cannot give, and multiply this offering that the name of Jesus Christ might be magnified from this day and forevermore. We ask it in his name. Amen. God. Thank you, worship team and Deborah again. Um, it's so good to hear the organ again. We have an old pipe organ in our church that's over a hundred years old. It's beautiful, uh, but it needs so much work done uh, to it. Uh, we were quoted uh, twenty to thirty thousand dollars to bring it back to its original state, and we've not done that. Um, we're not sure what we're going to do with that organ and our former building. Um, I do want to thank first again, and, and please understand, I very seldom if ever mention anything about offerings or finances. Usually I limit it to about once or twice a year. But I do have to tell you, there are a lot of costs that are going to go into um, moving and transforming some things. Um, just the wiring for Internet. Uh, I, I think we were quoted, what, $1,200, I think, for it. Um, and I know, Matt, Matt, you've been doing a lot. We appreciate it. And uh, we even had someone come and look to see if handicap accessibility could be done on the church. And uh, the, it would be astronomical. It would be over $70,000 to handicap this building, to make it handicap accessible in every way. So you can see a little bit of what we're against. And I, I don't share that to in any way, uh, you know, 
just being totally transparent and totally honest of what it's going to cost to do some of the things that I think need to be done here in, in this church, to beautify it, to make it better and more effective for the Lord. And we appreciate your giving and uh, whatever is decided through your giving of what will be bequeathed to Living Hope. Be assured it will be invested in this ministry and in this church building. So I just, I just wanted to get that in there to share that with you folks. Thank you. We're going to jump right into the message this morning. It is considered one of the most fascinating and most impregnable fortresses in ancient history. It was called Masada, an ancient Roman fortress built 1,300 feet above the Dead Sea. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, we want to, thank you, Diane, I almost forgot, we're going to dismiss the kids for junior church. I apologize for that. Uh, so the children that are here, we want to let you go today, have a good time, and we praise God for each of you. Thank you, Diane. I've got to get used to that. I've got to remember before, right when we're done the offering, we're going to dismiss the kids for junior church. So this Masada was built 1,300 feet above the Dead Sea on a barren, mountainous desert plateau. After the Romans overtook Judea and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, many of the revolting Jews fled to Masada and joined another group of Jewish rebels named the Sicarii. Their combined group numbered 1,000 people. Led by Flavius Silva, a legion of 8,000 Roman soldiers built camps around the surrounding base and seeds the fortress for many months without success. Masada was considered impregnable. But on April 15, 73 AD, after the Romans had built a tower and ramp to take out the fortress's front wall, on the instructions of the Jewish leader, Ben Yer, all but two women and five children took their lives rather than be captured and live as Roman slaves. That's the story of Masada. Maybe you've heard of it. It's an amazing story. This stirring story reminds us of the many intense battles the Jewish people have fought throughout their turbulent history. Many of their battles have resulted in great defeat and suffering, while others have marked God's miraculous protection and victory over their enemies. Well, today, as we continue our exciting series on the great faith chapter, chapter of Hebrews 11, we will examine one such miraculous battle God accomplished for his faith-filled people. By examining this key battle, we will discover how true living faith can likewise be a key factor to our own spiritual victory and success in our service for Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11. I've entitled today's message, Becoming People of Faith, Part 10, The Unlimited Power and Potential of Faith. The unlimited power and potential of faith. So if you could, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And for those who are a part of the first church, uh, we have been doing a series now for, I believe it's 11 weeks, 12 weeks, on the great faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. There's so much here in Hebrews 11. We have been able to look at some of the great Jewish leaders of the Old Testament. Uh, Abraham, Moses, uh, we've looked at uh, Abel and Noah, Enoch, we've looked at Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, but today we're going to look at two more unique individuals that you don't often think of, Joshua and Rahab, Joshua and Rahab. So today we continue our chronological journey of faith. In the Old Testament. And if you've noticed, the author of Hebrews has been going chronologically. He started with Abel, well, he really started with creation, 
and then it's Abel, and then Noah, and he's progressing down chronologically in the Old Testament. And we last looked at Moses, and it's now 40 years later. Israel has spent 40 years wandering in the desert, floundering because of their unbelief. And God raises up another new, younger leader named Joshua. Joshua. And Joshua was going to be the one to lead Israel, as we're going to see. Now, please keep in mind that the whole theme of Hebrews 11 is basically this. The author of Hebrews is trying to convince these first century Jews that God has always worked only one way, and it has always been through faith. It has never been through works. God has never redeemed man through his own effort. God has made it abundantly clear from the very beginning, even with Abel, that Abel had to bring a sacrifice in faith that would be accepted for the forgiveness of his sin. From the very beginning, God has always made it clear that man is saved by faith through grace. And, and it's not by works. It's not by the effort of the law. The author of Hebrews is trying to show these Jews that you may have followed the law at one time, but... You know, it's not the law that saves you. Moses, who was the mediator of the law, cannot save you. Only the mediator of the new covenant that we celebrate today through communion, Jesus Christ, is the only one that can redeem mankind. And it is only through trusting in his work for you. You have to transfer your trust from yourself to Jesus Christ. And that is the only way that God can save you this morning. So if you're trusting in your goodness, if you're trusting in your heritage, you're not going to make it to heaven according to the word of God because all of your good works are as filthy rags before God. The only way to know forgiveness and eternal life is by trusting in a Savior who died in your place to redeem you. And I pray and trust each of you have done that. Praise God. So, with that aside, we're going to very quickly look at four key principles, four key qualities of living faith that should mark our lives and ministries for Jesus Christ today. Point number one. To become people of faith, we must be committed to a ministry of courage for Jesus Christ. A ministry of courage. Christ is calling brave individuals, and this calling is not for the weak-hearted. He's calling for courage. Verse 30 tells us a little bit about this courage. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one here today that remembers the very popular song when we were a child. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. We all remember that, right? I, you don't want to hear me sing, trust me. You don't want to hear me sing. Those who know me can attest that. But Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And the walls came, what? Tumbling down. And what a marvelous story that is, not just for the young children here today, but for the oldest of heart, because it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story. You know, although Joshua is not mentioned by name here, he is no doubt indirectly referred to here as another strong leader of faith, an example that we should follow in our own Christian walk. For those who may not remember, Joshua was the leader who led Israel into the promised land. Remember, Moses had delivered, under God's direction, delivered the Israelites out of the clutch and captivity of Egypt, which was the powerhouse of the ancient world at that time. Egypt was the world power. And remember the ten plagues and how God took each of the ten gods of the Egyptian pantheon, and he showed himself more powerful than each of them. And what a beautiful story it is of God and his almighty power to deliver his people. But remember, we also looked at how they were delivered. They went to the Red Sea. God opens the Red Sea. God performs miracle after miracle. But then they come to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea! 
You should all know that name. They're just on the cusp of entering the promised land. And God says, okay, send. And it's debated as to whether God decided it or the people. But the people weren't quite sure. They hesitated. And when they hesitated, they asked if 12 spies, one from each tribe of Israel, could go search the land out. Remember? Two of the spies said, we can take this land. God is with us. That's all we need. The 10 other spies weren't thinking of God. They were thinking of what they saw with their eyes. And what did they see? They, see, they saw these large walled cities. Do you know what one of the walled cities was that they saw? Jericho. And they became frightened. They hesitated. They came back and said, no, we can't. Even though God is telling us we can, we can't. And what happened? God said, okay, you don't want what I want to give you? Okay, here, 40 years wandering in the desert. 40 years until that whole generation died out. God was, he was upset with that generation. He realized he couldn't work with them. Do you remember when Jesus worked, walked on this earth? He went to many cities performing miracles. We are told in Matthew 11 that there were certain cities that Jesus refused to enter. He refused because of their lack of faith. He would not go and bless them because they would not believe and trust in him. Do you see the connection? And Jesus, in Matthew 11, says of these cities, Chorazon being one of them, he said, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you, because you had the very Son of God there, ready and willing to work wonders. But you chose not to accept it. You see, folks, the greatest danger that looms for all of us is the danger of unbelief. Every day we live, we face a decision to either trust God or to question and doubt God. Every day. That's why it says the righteous shall live by faith. Every single day requires faith. Not just the hard trying days, but every day when you wake up in the morning and you rise up. I hope your prayer as I pray often, Lord, give me the strength today to honor you. It is an expression of faith and dependence on God. Joshua would lead Israel. Moses would not. Moses would see the land from a distance on Mount Nebo where he would die. But Joshua would, would be the one to lead them. And Joshua had a very daunting task in front of him to lead what we estimate to be close to 2 million Jews into a promised land. He was the younger protege of Moses. Moses had trained him, and Moses' ministry was over, and now Joshua's was beginning. This was no easy task. In fact, we know Joshua struggled with something we all struggle with. He struggled with fear. And fear and faith are complete opposites. You cannot live in the realm of faith and have fear. They cannot exist together. If you put oil and water together, they will not mix. Their their, uh, chemical compounds will not allow them to mix. Faith and fear cannot exist together. And so many times we are being controlled by faith more than fear. If you look at the beginning of Joshua, the book of Joshua, and you don't need necessarily turn there, I'll just read it to you. But in Joshua chapter 1, when God is commissioning the younger Joshua to take over for Moses, God is addressing something that Joshua is struggling with. God is addressing Joshua's fear. He says this, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers through Abraham. To give them only, and he underlines this, only be strong and very courageous. You see how he underscores that? Be strong and courageous. The Greek word, kazak. Kazak. 
It means to be courageous in the Hebrew. This is what the Jewish army often does in combat. The Jewish army that has beaten enemies ten times its size, the, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, all of these miraculous events where God allows his people to win when they really shouldn't, is supernatural. And the rally cry of the Jewish military is Kazakh! Be strong! Be courageous! That is God's call for each of us this morning, Kazakh. As we discussed again last week, fear is diametrically opposed to faith. And the enemy is going to try to stir up doubt and fear and confusion. That's how he works. And he can make it look like very rational, like we should be fearful. We got to do this. We got to do that. And logically, from a logical point of view, yeah. But we're not, we're not serving Christ in logic. Christ doesn't say, be logical as you follow me. He says, have faith. That's what he says. He doesn't say, look at the, be logical, weigh the odds, weigh the percentages, go with what is going to, what's worked before. No, he usually tells us to do just the opposite. He tells us to do what seems humanly impossible because he wants to display his power and glory in us. That's why we live and breathe to display before the world his glory and power. You see, like Joshua, this means we will need to act upon God's promises, God's presence, God's power, and not upon our fears, emotions, and insecurities. You know, I meet so many people, they're controlled by their emotions. And I'm a very emotional person, I'm, I'm Italian. You talk about emotional people, the Italians are emotional. You should see when I would get together with my mom's family down in South Philly, man, it was emotional in every way, whether it's an argument, crying, tears. Italians are emotional. There's nothing wrong with emotions. But when your emotions control you, you're not living by faith. You're living by feeling. You're not living by the facts of God's word. And when I counsel people, I often tell them that. I say, what, what are you basing this on? Is this based on what God says and his promise? Or is this based on your own fears and insecurities and emotions? And I'd say 90% of the time, it's our emotion. We need to act, not react. We need to be Kazakh. We need to be strong and courageous. Those who act upon the promises of God's word not upon emotion and feeling. Because your emotions and feelings are going to be a roller coaster ride of confusion, doubt, and regret. Don't do it. Don't do it. The key truth that I try to bring out here is that by living by faith requires taking risks. Are you a risk taker? When I was younger, I used to be very conservative. I was very logical. I was a very good chess player. Everything was logic to me. And I would weigh and analyze. That's what you do in chess. You have to. But you know, as I've grown in a Christian, I realize that that's the last thing I need to be doing many times. I need to be not depending on my logic, but depending on the promises of my God. You know, someone has uh, once said that the last words of a dying church is, but we've never done it that way before. <laughs> Please don't take that the wrong way. But it's true. We've never done it that way before. People don't like taking risks. And yet God is calling us at the cusp of our history, at First Church and Living Hope, to take a risk. And to test him that he will not bless this ministry beyond measure as we step out and obey him. Not acting upon our feelings, our logic, but the promises of God. Our joint venture will not be easy, but we need courage. And courage requires coming out of your comfort zone and being willing to do things that you normally don't do. 10, 15. <laughs> I thought that out. we've all, Living Hope's never met at 1015. First Church has never left at 10. Hey, it's our first step of stepping out and doing something different. Praise God. That's faith. It might seem like a small change, but it's a significant one.
because we're all agreeing we all need to be willing to change. We need courage. Second point, we got to move on quickly here. To become people of faith, we must be committed to a ministry of constancy, constancy for Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 30, we are briefly told here how Joshua and the Israelites brought the walls of Jericho down. We know the end result, but how did it come about? The author of Hebrews tells us. It's interesting. He didn't need to. He could have just said the walls came tumbling down. Notice what he says, though. He says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Now, you would think it would end there, but notice the next phrase. After, notice after, conditional, after they had been encircled for seven days. Well, why is he putting that in there? What's so important about that? The key was that God brought the walls down. Yeah, God brought the walls down because of the obedience of his people. That's the connection. God was telling the Israelites to do something that was militarily foolish. Stupid. You don't march around a walled city. It's the last thing you would do. Why? Two reasons. One, you are exposing yourself to the enemy that's protected. They can throw down stuff at you easily. Especially if they know you're doing it and they're going to continue to do it for seven days. Right? And then the second thing is, imagine the ridicule of the people. You're standing up on the walls. <laughs> you're, you're really hurting us by walking around our walled city. Could you imagine the ridicule and the mocking they would have received? They probably would have, probably most likely would have thrown dung down on them. They urine. They, this was part of the strategy in ancient military was to try to get in the mind of your combat and your, your enemy. They would have thrown urine, uh, rocks. They would have ridiculed them, mocked them. Can you imagine if you're an Israelite? Come on now, think about it. Just put yourself there for a second. All right, God, you've told us to take the land. We've obeyed you. Why are you telling us to walk around the city? Not just once, not just twice, three, four, five, six, seven, and then on the seventh day, seven times, a total of 13 times. Lucky 13. <laughs> 13 times. Do you know how what long it would have taken to walk around Jericho? We have found Jericho. We have found all of the ancient sites of the Bible. Archaeology just continues to prove and validate Scripture over and over again. We, have, we know where Jericho is. It, it's about nine acres, nine acres of ground it took up. So it would take you about 30 minutes, give or take, to walk around one time. So 30 minutes each day, they were hearing the insults, having the urine and all the yucky stuff thrown at them, all this stuff going on every day. And then on the seventh day, it would have taken three and a half hours to walk around seven times. Three and a half hours. Wouldn't you have some protests? Come on, be honest. You're a warrior of Israel. Lord, we can just charge the front gate. Come on, let us fight. You're letting us walk around wasting all this time. They're ridiculing us. They would have had issues, you would think, right? Here's what's so amazing. We're never told in Joshua 6 that the people ever complained. Is this the same people that constantly yelled at Moses, complaining, oh, Moses, bring us back to Egypt. Ah, da, 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 da. Same people. Well, it's a different generation. Do you think that this generation learned their lesson? <laughs> because of the complaining and lack of faith of the first generation, they wandered and died in the desert. Do you think this next generation is going to make the same mistake? No way, Jose, as we like to say. No way. They learned a lesson. Are we learning a lesson? Have we seen how when we try to figure it out and work it out on our own, it fails? Have we come to the end of ourselves? Are we willing to trust God even to the extent of doing things that seem foolish? Didn't Paul say in his Corinth, to the Corinthians in his letter that we need to be willing to become a fool for Christ? 
Yeah? Are we willing to put aside the world's thinking and embrace something that is going to be looked at as foolish, stupid, and everything else to follow Christ? You see, that's part of our calling. It really is. To be willing to be a fool for Christ. To the Jews, the cross is foolishness. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. The world is going to look at our faith in a risen Christ, a crucified, and they're going to mock. Does that determine whether we obey God or not? No. That is faith. Faith is riveted on God, the promises of God, and is willing to obey no matter what the cost. I meet so many Christians, they condition their obedience. Well, if it's convenient, I'll do it. If it's not, mm, sorry. God's not going to bless that thinking or that lifestyle. He still loves you. And he'll still be there for you, but you're not going to know the full blessing that he wants. It takes constancy, consistency, constant faith day in and day out to obey, trusting in God's goodness. That's what God wants from us. In Joshua 1.16, listen to what the people said to Joshua. You think they learned the lesson from the 40 years in the desert? Listen to this. They, the people of Israel, answered Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And whatever or wherever you send us, we will go. Woo-hoo-hoo. Man, from a pastor's standpoint, to have a congregation that would say that, <laughs> oh man, Woo-hoo. I'd be celebrating. Uh, <laughs> I really would, Pete. <laughs> I'd owe to have that in, uh, in God's people, sheep that are willing to actually follow their shepherd. <laughs> Praise God. But That's what God had to break Israel to a point where they would trust him and trust the leader he put over them to go wherever he directed them, whatever the orders were, they obeyed. That's what I want in my life. I want obedience. I hope that you do too. Third point, very quickly. To become people of faith, we must be committed to a ministry of conquest for Jesus Christ conquest. You know, the first was courage, the second constancy, the third conquest. I don't know if you know this, but the theme of the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, if you had to come up with one word to describe the whole book, it's simply the word conquest. God's mission for his people was to take over the land of Canaan, to take it over from the Canaanites. And it wasn't going to be easy because it would require battles and sacrifices. Remember, they crossed the Jordan. They crossed the Red Sea, the first generation, but that wasn't enough. They doubted God. The second generation, they crossed the Jordan River. They learned from their mistakes, and they went into battle. They went to take the land with confidence, courage, and faith. You see, God was calling his people under Joshua's leadership to destroy the Canaanites. Now, I... Say with me on this. I meet people, they say, hey, God is such a loving God. Hey, wait a minute. How is he sanctioning murder and killing people? Well, that's a good question. It's a good question until you study your history and research the Canaanite people. The Canaanites were debased people. They offered their children for human sacrifice. That's really the first forms of abortion that we see. They were cruel to each other, to their enemies. They were uh, involved in cultic prostitution and all different arrays of immorality and evil. Now, does that mean that they deserve to be destroyed? From a theological standpoint, yes. We all deserve to be destroyed because of our sin. It says, for the wages of sin is death. And apart from God's grace, guess what? You and I deserve one thing. You know what it is? Hell. Let's be honest. Do you really think God owes you something? You know what the answer to that is? Absolutely not. Zero. God owes you and I nothing. The only thing that we deserve from God is his justice, which would be to have all of us obliterated this instant and spend eternity in hell. That's what we deserve. Because that's the wage of sin. So anything beyond that is grace. If God saves me, it's grace. If God blesses me with health and a family, that is grace. It's all grace. (laughs) 
That's why I sing and we sing of the song Amazing Grace. The Canaanites deserved to be put to death. Justice was served, and he used the Israelites to do it. The problem is the Israelites made a mistake again. <laughs> if you read the book of Judges that follows Joshua, the problem was they didn't destroy all of the Canaanites. They began to make compromises with their culture. They began to adopt some of the gods of the Canaanites. They began to adopt some of the practices of the Canaanites. They even began to marry some of the Canaanites. They compromised. And when you get to the book of Judges, that's why they're in need of new leaders that can deliver them from the bondage of their sin. And those judges God raised up to help them. But the thing that I want you to understand is that Jericho was a Canaanite city. It was filled with evil people. And we know from studies that the walls would have been about 30 feet high. They would have been about 12 feet wide. And we know that this was not an easy city to take. And what I want you to understand today is that Jesus Christ, like Joshua, is calling us to go into a foreign land, and that is Wilkesbury. That is our complete surroundings. We are not of this world. Our citizenship is with Christ. He's calling us to enter into a foreign land to do battle and to conquest for him. And what is he asking us to win for him? He's asking us to win souls of men and women that do not know Jesus Christ. That is the uh, military order from our commander-in-chief. And he's leading us here to South Wilkes Wilkesbury for that specific purpose, to reach the people of this neighborhood. That's why he's moving Living Hope here. Okay, it's quite clear that's why he's moving us here. He has compassion on the lost, and he desires all to come to know him. And he's calling us to come together and work together to conquer Wilkesbury for Jesus Christ. And I hope that excites some of you. Can I hear an amen at all? Amen to that? Praise God. That is, his, that is the military orders of my commander-in-chief, and I am relaying it to you. Okay? Don't kill the messenger. That is his message to you, okay? And you have to decide whether you want to be a part of God's army and the mission of reaching Wilkesbury. I'm looking for people that want to follow, not me per se, but the Lord Jesus Christ, and that want to see people come to Christ and to grow in the relationship with Jesus Christ. That is my passion. That is my calling on my life. I would hope I could have more join us to do that very thing. The people were willing to follow Joshua. I hope you're willing to follow because it will not be an easy task. The wall is 30 feet high, 12 feet wide. What does that wall represent? It represents the fortresses of resistance from the evil one. Remember in Matthew 16 when God says not even the gates of Hades will be able to prevail against the church. You know what he was talking about there? The strength of a city was found in its wall, in its fortress. It's kind of ironic as Americans. I don't want to say anything unpolitically incorrect, but, you know, we are one of the few nations that don't have a wall to protect our nation. Every other nation in the world does. We don't. And what does that show you? It shows you weakness. Because the strength of a country, the strength of a city, is based upon its wall. And in Matthew 16, Christ is saying, not only, not only all the fortresses and power and strength of Hades can defeat my church. Why? Because I will be with my people. And they will conquer in my name. That is the confidence we can have. Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful. Notice, for the destruction of fortresses. Paul is reminding the Corinthians and reminding us God has called us to obliterate the enemy's strongholds. 
Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Do you get excited about that? That God has commissioned you to be a part of a mission that is the greatest mission ever in mankind to reach the loss, to bring down the walls, not just of Jericho, but the walls of the evil one that he has set up here in Wilkesbury. You know what we're dealing with in Wilkesbury, the drugs, the violence. This is where God wants us to be. When Christ ministered, it wasn't with the wealthy. It wasn't with the prestigious. It was with the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the down and out. To be a follower of Christ, you have to have that same vision. If you don't, you're not following Christ. You're following some other gospel. I don't know what it is, but you're they're not following Christ. Christ has commissioned his church to go into the cities, to go into the down and out, into the dirty. And we need to be willing to do that as well. God wants us to bring down fortresses in his name. The last point, I promise you, I'll do this ever so quickly. I know we've got to end with communion here, but point number four, to become people of faith, we must be committed to a ministry of conversion for Jesus Christ, for conversion. Verse 31 talks about an unknown person that we would not really put in the hall of faith. She was a woman. She was a Gentile. She was a prostitute, Rahab. And you know what Rahab represents? Rahab represents the fact that God is calling his gospel to reach each and every nationality, each and every gender, each and every race. Jesus Christ is not a respecter of persons. When he hung on the cross and he died, he died for everyone. Every single dirty, unworthy individual. That's the love of Christ. And I hope it's that love that has your heart and is compelling you to want to reach those around you. Rahab, listen to this, Rahab wasn't just a woman, not just a prostitute, not just a Gentile. You know who she was? She was an Amorite. The Amorites were the sworn enemies of Israel. Remember when they entered the land, the Amorites wouldn't let the Israelites pass through. They had to go around. And God cursed the Amorites for not blessing his people. She was the worst of worst. <laughs> and yet... She turns to Jesus Christ. See, there are examples in Scripture of civil disobedience. Her king told her to hand over the spies. She refused. There are exceptions in Scripture. We are to submit to our government in every instance. And let me underscore that. Every single instance, we are to show submission and respect for our leaders. Why? Because God put them there. The only time, the only time we are to disobey is when they give us a direct and specific command that conflicts with Scripture. This was the case with human life. And we saw how many Jews were hid during World War II. And do you know that many of these people that hid these Jews lost their lives? They did what Rahab did. The hiding place, Cory Ten Boom. She survived, her sister died, all because they were hiding Jews. Rahab does the same thing. Now, why would Rahab have done that? Well, we're told in Joshua chapter 2. Let me just read it. So this is, these are her words. I know the Lord has given you the land. She knew it before the Israelites probably even knew it. That's what's so ironic. Remember the other generation? They're saying, we, don't, we can't take the land. This, this gal who's not even a follower of Yahweh, who's living in a distant land, she knows. Notice, I know the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you. Doesn't that give you goosebumps? This gal was smart enough to see the signs. She was smart enough to know that her gods did not have the power of Yahweh. Her gods could not open up the Red Sea. Her gods could not deliver people from the most superpower of that time, Egypt. She knew. And that's where faith comes in. Faith comes by hearing. 
and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10. That's why every Sunday you hearing the word of God taught is so vital because it's through your hearing and understanding of God and his word that will build your faith over time. And that's why your presence here among many reasons is so important. I tell people that I spend the whole week praying and asking God to reveal to me what, he, what you need to hear, what, what I need to tell you. And I bring up the treasures that God gives me from his word and I give them to you every Sunday so that you can grow in your faith and honor him. That's why. Sunday mornings are important, among many other reasons. Last thing about Rahab, and then we'll conclude. Rahab, if you don't know it or not, is mentioned in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? A harlot? A Canaanite? Why is she mentioned? Well, we know she came to faith. And she became part of the community. And she was the great, great grandmother of King David. Isn't that awesome? You see, what's that telling us? It's telling us that God can use the broken. He can save what seems unsalvageable. God is the maker of a masterpiece, which is each of you. You display his grace, his wonders, and how he can change the cold heart to a loving, obedient heart. And Rahab was that very thing. In closing then, and I know I, 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 know I went over today, I felt led to do this because I believe this is so important, what we're looking at today. There is a response, and I'm just going to do it very quickly. Number one, we need to commit to forging ahead with a confident and courageous faith that renounces any fear, doubt, or complaining. We need to renounce fear. We need to renounce doubt. I didn't put it up there, I don't think, but we need to renounce also complaining. Please, if you're someone that likes to complain, let's get it out in the very beginning here while we're starting our ministry together. You have a right to complain, but this is what I tell you. If you have a complaint, come up with a solution, and I'll be more than willing to listen to you. If you're just going to complain with no solution, I don't want to hear it, nor does God. <laughs> uh, that's, I'm just laying that out straight out. Complaining doesn't get you anywhere. It just frustrates you, and it frustrates those who are trying to lead you. So renounce it. Renounce the complaining attitude. Renounce the fear, the doubt, and embrace faith. Number two. We need to commit to forging ahead with an unwavering constancy to obey God's word and to follow his Holy Spirit's leading. In other words, our ambition must be to obey. Whether it makes sense or not, I don't care. I do not care. It's not about what makes sense because God often inverts things. He turns it upside down. He says the weak are strong. He says the first shall be last. God does not work by our logic. He doesn't. Stop trying to figure out God. Stop trying to figure out everything and surrender to your Lord and follow him. Isn't that what the disciples did? They dropped their nets. They gave up everything and they followed Christ. Let's do the same. Number three, we need to commit to forging ahead with a desire to spiritually conquer and convert our neighborhood in South Wilkesbury with the saving message of Jesus Christ. There are people that need the Lord that are right around this church. And first church, don't take this the wrong way, but maybe through the years because you've grown older and you've become, you know, maybe that hasn't been as quite as an emphasis. I'm sure you care for the unsaved. But we need to get back to the basics and get back to how can we... That field, that, that, that grassy knoll, for better word out there, we can use that. We can use that to invite the community out. And I'm hoping in the future we're going to find ways, creative ways to use it, to, to bring people in. We need to be about the Lord's business. Fourth and final, we need to commit to forging ahead with a spirit of trust and cooperation in working together as the body of Jesus Christ. It's not going to be easy. 
Some of you may not particularly like me, like my style of teaching or preaching. I'm used to it. I, you know, I, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm sorry. I'm here to bring you what you need from the Word of God. And even if you don't like me or like my subject, that's okay. I still love you, and I'm going to still want to be your pastor. Um, but <laughs> let's try to put aside our differences as much as we can and work together. Let's work together because it's not about me. I don't care if you like me or not, but I want you to like him. <laughs> and I want you to love him, in fact, and serve him faithfully. And if I can help you do that, I'll be excited. I hope you will be as well. So, again, I appreciate you letting me share all of this. I know it was a lot, but I think it was needed, especially for our first official Sunday. We're going to go into communion now and then close the service with a closing hymn. God commands us. He says, do this in remembrance of me. In the Greek, it's a command. It's an imperative. God wants us to remember him. Someone has once said the greatest sin that we can commit is the sin of forgetting God. Sometimes we get so busy in life, we forget him, don't we? He wants to be the center of your thoughts, your affections, your activities throughout the day. And communion is a reminder of that. He wants you to remember what he did for you, what he sacrificed for you. Someone has once said that all of our sacrifices pale in the comparison and the shadow of the cross. All of our sacrifices pale in the shadow of the cross. If we can understand the depth of Christ's love, it will compel us to give everything for him. So let's remember he was almighty God in flesh, and yet he endured mockings, ridicules. He would have been stripped bare. He would have been whipped. He would have been challenged when they were saying, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Can you imagine that? God almighty being challenged and saying, no, I'm going to submit and allow myself to hang here and die for you. That is grace. That is love. So let us take the elements and let's start with the bread and the bread of course is a symbol of the body of jesus christ my wife did this for me and i'm trying to see if i can get it out and i'm going to ask her for her help because it doesn't seem like it's separating and i don't want to spill it on the nice rugs here bang son so as we partake of the bread, please understand that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that the bread symbolizes the body, the physical body that suffered, but also the spiritual body. That's us. And he reminds us that it's one bread, meaning that we are all one in Christ. So part of communion's purpose is to affirm that we are one. We may all like different football teams, unfortunately. We all may have different preferences to music, clothing. That's okay. We can be different and yet one in him, one in his love, one in his truth. So as we partake of the bread, let's affirm that. Lord, make us one in you. And then the juice, which again, okay, I got it this time, hon. I depend on my wife. My wife is my, I'm blessed. The cup, of course, is symbol of the blood. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. People have asked me, Pastor, could Jesus have done any other thing to save us other than going to the cross? And the answer is no. The law required a life for a life. Christ died as your substitute in your place for your sin. And all I want us to say as we partake of the cup is simply, Lord, thank you. Let's just say that together. Lord, thank you. For those who may not know, we're going to close in our closing hymn. We do a benevolence offering. Every month, we take a separate offering from our general offering. 
and we set this money aside so it can't be touched for any other reason than to help those who are in need, either in our church or in our community. And there are many that are in need. You see what's happening with the economy. People are struggling. We try to pay heating bills, maybe uh, medical expenses, whatever. So if you feel led, you give. Know that it will be given to those that are in need. So let me have the ushers. Do we have two? Uh, Curtis is upstairs and Azalea. They're going to come down real quick and grab the offering plates. And again, continue to pray for us because there's so much work that needs to be done. It's going to take months upon months of not just moving things. Like we have a piano, beautiful piano at our church. It's going to cost at least three, four hundred dollars, I'd say minimum, to move that. It's, there's going to be so many costs involved. So keep us in prayer um, because we believe this is what the Lord wants us to do and we're willing to count the cost. But, um, oh, Curtis, <laughs> we lost part of the plate there. All right, let's, let's, let's pray. That's okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us to follow you and that it's not always easy. The one thing you require from all of us is faith, faith and obedience. Lord, grow our faith. Grow our willingness to obey. Help us to trust you more and to trust ourselves less. We thank you that you are trustworthy, and we thank you that we can now give to minister to those who are in need. Bless those who give and those who cannot, and use this offering for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for giving us this privilege to be with you and with one another today. May we leave today rejoicing, but also with greater resolve that we will be people of faith, not of fear, not of emotion, not of doubt, not of complaining, but a heart of trust and obedience. Lord, make that true today in my heart and each of ours. Dis dismiss us now with your richest blessing. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Peace be.